Spring, 1950. A secret location, the Republic of Korea, the southern half of a divided nation. It is less than five years since hostilities ceased at the end of the Second World War, the deadliest war in history. A conflict that has left the world divided between Eastern communism and Western democracy. Men of the Republic of the South's army are preparing a mass execution in a land riven by the hatred between a communist Northern regime and a pro-Western Southern government such brutal punishments are commonplace on both sides. The victims are accused of being spies for the North. The United States, a staunch supporter of the South, claims to have no knowledge of mass executions. footage is shot by a combat cameraman from the United States Army Signals Corps. Significantly, the presence of a US Army colonel at the execution confirms that the death sentences are being carried out under the auspices of SUSLAC, the acronym of a secret organization, the Special United States Liaison Activity Korea, an offshoot of the newly formed CIA. The shocking brutality of these executions is a portent of the terror that will soon be visited on the people of Korea, when atrocities will be committed by both sides, the details of which will stay undisclosed for decades, and some of which may remain hidden forever. <laughs> Moscow. 28th of June, 1950. A performance at the Palace of Culture by a North Korean choral and dance troupe in honor of Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. Three days earlier, on June 25th, using Soviet-trained men equipped with its tanks, artillery and aircraft, a force of over 200,000 North Korean troops had launched a shock blitzkrieg attack against its South Korean neighbor. By the evening of the Moscow concert, Seoul, South Korea's capital, has fallen and its army has been completely routed. It is the opening salvo in a murderous conflict that will cost the lives of a million combat troops and over two million civilians. It will also bring the United States and its Western allies into direct conflict with China and the Soviet Union and drive the world closer to the Armageddon of an atomic war than at any time in history. Using original color film, fully restored in high definition, much of it never seen before. This is the story of Korea, the forgotten war in color. Korea, the land of the morning calm.
It is a fiercely independent nation, known as the Hermit Kingdom, because of its isolated position on its own rugged peninsula. Korea has experienced only sparse migration, and its people claim strong ethnic homogeneity. However, Korea has large and powerful neighbors, China to the west, Japan across the sea to the east, and during the 20th century, a communist-led Russian empire to the north, the Soviet Union. Korea had been occupied by Japan in 1910. For 35 years, until the end of the Second World War, the Japanese had tried to suppress Korean identity, language and culture. The end of the war and Japanese occupation had brought a new dilemma. Korea became trapped between the world's new power blocks, the United States and its Western allies, and the Soviet Union and its communist supporters, particularly China. The country was arbitrarily divided at the 38th parallel of latitude. In 1948, Korea became the front line of the Cold War in Asia, with a communist government in the north and a pro-Western regime in the South. Writing in 1950, Korean poet and schoolteacher Yu Chi Hwan senses the danger facing his country. I finally realize driving on your coast, East Sea, that for 5,000 years, no, from the dividing of earth and sky, your mute but unfailing care has fostered this peninsula, my beloved country. Your blue dreams that even roll, and your sometimes tumultuous spirit have given us rugged mountains and rivers and fields. And you have kept watch over this poor nation nestled in your domain. East Sea, nurturing mother of my country. You lie today under a veil of cloud and mist, heavy with anxiety over the calamity engulfing this land. Powerful and ruthless men lead the divided country. In the south, Syngman Rhee, a staunchly right-wing authoritarian, and in the north, Kim Il-sung, an equally autocratic ruler and an ardent communist. North Korea's June 25th attack had been Kim Il-sung's attempt to unify the country under a communist regime. It almost succeeds, and during the long, hot summer of 1950, the Republic of South Korea is on the brink of annihilation. The Army of the North, the North Korean People's Army, has Soviet T-34 tanks and a highly disciplined and experienced infantry. September 1950, Sunyuji, North Korea, close to the Chinese border at the Yalu River, the opening of a hydroelectric plant. Although the economy of North Korea is still based on traditional agriculture and constrained by the communist policy of collectivization, with Soviet aid, it is introducing mechanization and launching major capital projects to strengthen its infrastructure. 
North Korean Foreign Minister Pak Hun Young writes to the President of the United Nations on September 28, 1950, placing the blame for the conflict on South Korean leader Syngman Rhee. He suggests the North strike is merely a preemptive attack to thwart the South's aggression. The United States government supplied the treacherous bandits of Seungman Ri with political, military, and economic aid and help in working out the aggressive plan for the invasion of North Korea. Such encouragement spurred the Ri clique to start the civil war in Korea. The government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea took all measures to achieve the peaceful unification of our fatherland and as far back as May 1950, received reliable information that the Seungman Ri clique had scheduled an attack on North Korea for mid-June 1950. This enabled our government to take timely measures for repulsing Ri's troops. The Army of the Republic of Korea in the south has only meager battle experience and is poorly equipped. Months before the June 25th attack, Syngman Rhee had written to his Western allies, the United States. Amidst heightened tension with the North, Rhee, desperate to protect the South's burgeoning economy, requested more aid and weapons from the US. His thoughts were summarized in an official US memo. I would like to have enough rifles to keep 20,000 men on the northern border. With sufficient equipment, the South Korean army could be increased by 100,000 within six weeks. If I could increase the army in this way, in a short time, I could move into the north Nothing can be achieved by waiting. One of our principal difficulties is the vacillations of the U.S. State Department, which led to the loss of China and might be seriously harmful to Korea. Fearing the consequences for stability in the region, Rhee's request was denied in Washington. But following the North's unexpected attack and the threat of communist aggression throughout Asia, especially towards Japan and Taiwan, US President Harry Truman commits US forces to the defense of the South. While civilians flee in search of safety, a Security Council resolution of the United Nations establishes a UN command under the authority of the United States. Second World War veteran General Douglas MacArthur is appointed as the commander of the force. On July 5th, the first UNC troops, Task Force Smith, attempt a defense of the city of Osan, south of Seoul, to no avail. The Army of the South and US-led UNC forces fight a series of delaying engagements as the NKPA, the Army of the North, makes relentless progress down the Korean peninsula. US Air Force B-29 Super Fortress bombing raids on the North begin at the end of July, 1950. The Super Fortress has a payload of 20,000 pounds of bombs. Inevitably, captured US bomber pilots soon join the growing ranks of prisoners of war. With the rapidly escalating involvement of UNC ground troops, the ranks of prisoners soon include men from several UNC countries. There will be many thousands of POWs on all sides by the end of the war, many of whom will be mistreated and fail to survive to the end of hostilities. 
the port city of Incheon, under the control of the NKPA, September 1950. Anyone suspected of being a supporter of the South is dealt with harshly. This is a civil war, as well as an international one. Brother against brother, family against family, friend against friend. UNC forces have formed the Busan perimeter, a defensive position east of the Naktong River and along a line to the coast, only a hundred kilometers north of the vital port of Busan. The Busan perimeter is now the only part of the Korean peninsula held by the South and UNC forces. They are trying to hold it against sustained attacks from the Army of the North. The battle is ferocious, but the UNC is being reinforced on a daily basis, especially by US Marines. Busan is Korea's second largest port and is unloading 30 ships a day. Pershing tanks are also arriving which proved to be the equal of the formidable Soviet T-34s. As the South's resources are being replenished by the arrival of more and more UNC troops and material, the Northern Army's supply lines are becoming seriously overextended. Its men are exhausted and its losses escalating. The Zan perimeter holds and the momentum of the North's offensive begins to ebb. Simultaneously, General MacArthur is about to launch a highly risky counterattack far to the North to outflank the NKPA. He chooses the surprise landing ground of Inchon, the harbour of Seoul. 30 kilometers west of the capital. It is an extremely hazardous assault in a difficult environment. Its only auspicious aspect is that it might take the north by surprise. strategy is a masterstroke and leads to the total collapse of the NKPA's offensive in the south. NKPA snipers and camouflaged machine gun positions make progress slow and costly for both sides. In a letter retrieved from his body on the perimeter of Kimpo Airport, an unnamed NKPA soldier. The Americans have too much firepower. We only have what we can carry. Our tanks have no fuel, and we have no answer to their air attacks. 
I wish I was with you and our beautiful little girl. But I'm a long way from home, and I doubt I will ever see it again. Hold it tight, and think of me. After successfully establishing a bridgehead and securing Kimpo Airport, the flag of the South, the Republic of Korea, is raised over Incheon. An elite group of the Northern Army, 20,000 strong, retreats to Seoul, where it forms a final redoubt. The fighting in the city is ferocious. The United Nations force uses its aerial power to bombard the city, and napalm strikes cause fires to break out in heavily populated areas. Significant civilian casualties are inevitable. The northern defenders even launch suicide attacks in a desperate attempt to hold the city. Seoul finally falls to US-led UNC forces on September 27th, 1950. The beleaguered population sees its city captured by an advancing army twice in three months. Further south, UNC troops who have broken out of the Busan perimeter are soon able to join their comrades around Seoul. The collapse of the North's NKPA costs the lives of over 150,000 men and the capture of 125,000 more. UNC losses, including the attack on Incheon, are less than 20,000. Korea escalates, UNC forces use United States air power to try to weaken the North's infrastructure. The US Far East Air Force claims that civilians are not targeted. Pyongyang, September 1950, a UNC bombing raid. Kim Chung, a schoolteacher in the city. We are terrified. The children are terrified. The bombs kill you instantly, but the fires are the worst. People are trapped. Many are burned alive, even women and children. Nampo, the port of Pyongyang, 40 kilometers west of the city. Bombing raids will become a central part of UNC strategy, but they will cause widespread devastation to the north. Is human hatred such a cruel thing? All that remains here is a miserable denial of human dignity. 
only wreckage remains of what man worked so hard to create and possess. I cannot think of a word of consolation for an old man squatting on the ruins of his home. At the tip of Yonghung Bay, the high, leaden waves of the East Sea rage. And far down at the edge of Myeongsashimni Beach, a group of airplanes exhibits merciless determination. Everything in sight exudes intense hatred. If this is mankind's inevitable way, how can I avoid marching on in lonely fury? A local Communist Party report on the devastation in Pyongyang. The American bombers attack us with their bombs, thinking that if they destroy our buildings, they will destroy our will to fight. Do they not realize that their weapons have the opposite effect? For every pile of rubble and every dead comrade, there are a thousand new recruits to our cause. North Korea's east coast, October. A North Korean army column has been caught in the open. Pak Tu Chin, a soldier with the NKPA. They were my friends, but not anymore. They are gone. I hope the cause we're fighting for is worth it. Our leaders tell us it is. But we are fighting our brother Koreans. Why? On September 30th, 1950, the South Korean army, the ROK, crosses the 38th parallel. The US forces follow on October 7th. The South Korean army captures the coastal city of Wonsan on October 10th, in readiness for a drive across the mountains to Pyongyang, the capital city of the north. Pak Sun Yop, commanding officer of the 1st Division of the ROK, pleads with US General Frank Milburn that his Korean unit be allowed to lead the attack on Pyongyang. We are tough. We can march all day and all night. Give us this chance. We can beat any American unit to Pyongyang. It is my hometown, and I know the terrain like a bag of my hand. General Milburn just sat silently for what seems like hours. Finally, he said, General Beck, go for it. I walked into HQ with a huge smile on my face. We lead the attack. The room erupted in a chorus of happy shouting. True to his boast, Pak's Korean 1st Division is the first to reach Pyongyang on October 19th, 1950. UNC forces in the south have the advantage of the immense support of the United States Navy, the Royal Navy, and vessels from Canada, New Zealand, 
and Australia. By the time of the attack on the North, the North Korean Navy has been obliterated and the UNC has total control of the seas. It is at liberty to use its aircraft carriers to launch airstrikes. Wave after wave of Corsair and Sky Raider fighters attack the North. Its battleships and cruisers are able to bombard coastal cities unopposed. A confidential North Korean army report to Kim Tu Bong chairman of the Supreme People's Assembly. Our brave comrades almost secured the liberation of the south from Syngman Rhys Lekis, but now they are being destroyed by our overwhelming odds. The south's superiority in the air is impossible to defend against. The support of their fighter planes gives them an advantage that the valiant heroes of our army cannot resist. Without the intervention of our Chinese and Soviet allies, we will soon be pressed back all the way to the Chinese border. Our fatherland is being destroyed. I do not doubt the courage of our men. Their will to fight is as strong as ever. The issue is weapons, supplies and aircraft. We need meek fighters to clear the skies. The rapid advance of United Nations forces towards North Korea's border with China at the Yalu River creates alarm in Beijing and Moscow. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin promises China large-scale military support, and in early October, Chinese leader Mao Zedong agrees that Chinese troops will fight in support of their North Korean allies. Advancing UNC troops are unaware that China is amassing a huge army of 300,000 volunteers for the campaign. The first contact between Mao's troops and US-led UNC forces occurs in late October. That and subsequent encounters do not go well for the forces of the South. By the end of November, the UNC is in full withdrawal. For the Americans, it will become the longest retreat in their military history. Many of the Chinese communist soldiers had fought in China's long and bloody civil war. Many of the United States infantry had fought against the German army in Europe and many of its Marines against Japan in the Pacific. The fighting is intense.
from The Unforgettable People by Yu Chun Do, a volunteer surgeon with the Army of the North. Blood spreads on the river, and the water turns the color of earth. Bodies flow downstream. You must live, return to the rear. There will be no more wounded for you to treat. The young commander says to me solemnly, exhorting me to hold life sacred. He steps out into his own death. Then he begins to cross the river of no return, leading soldiers who will not return, who will dye the river red. As the grip of the Korean winter of 1950 tightens, the predicament of UNC forces worsens. Its positions are overrun. Its units are in disarray. General MacArthur sends an urgent message to Washington suggesting that, like six months earlier, the whole of the Korean peninsula is in danger of falling to the communists. Even the increasing ferocity of US Air Force strikes is unable to stem the flow. Kim Song, a soldier with the retreating army of the South. Our position is hopeless. Even with all the firepower the Americans bring us, we can't hold the North with the Chinese leading their advance. There are just too many. Kim Song is killed just a few days later. This is from the last entry in his diary. I fear for my country. This fight was started by Koreans but it will be finished by forces beyond our shores. Our long history may be over. In a typically ferocious Korean winter, Chinese, Korean, American, British and Commonwealth, and men from nine other United Nations command countries struggle to hold their frozen ground. In the Freezing Trench by Tang Soo Chol, a Pyongyang newspaper editor and volunteer in the NKPA. The temperature falls below zero again and my very marrow seems to freeze. As I stand in this dark trench aiming straight at the enemy. I weep thinking of my hometown and of my family moaning through the night, shaking with dread under the enemy's evil hoofs. Washington's dilemma is either to accept the humiliation of defeat or to escalate the war even more and face the prospect of the involvement of the Soviet Union and its battle-hardened Red Army.
Even more alarmingly, engaging the entire communist world on the battlefield could place the world on the threshold of World War III. A war that almost certainly would be an atomic one. US President Harry Truman, who had sanctioned the use of the atom bomb against Japan in 1945, shocks the world by stating publicly that if necessary, he will authorize its use again and that he will allow General MacArthur to take the decision. MacArthur decides quickly what his targets in China and North Korea will be and will require 26 atomic weapons for the strikes. President Truman asks the US Congress for $16.8 billion for his defense budget and declares a state of national emergency to prepare for global war. Right-wing opinion in the US hardens even more when Chinese-led northern troops enter Seoul at the beginning of 1951. South Korean President Syngman Rhee writes to President Truman. If we lose this opportunity, the Chinese and Northern Communists will destroy all our armed forces and most of the anti-communist population. To save this situation, we must do all we can to defeat and destroy the Chinese invaders now and authorize General MacArthur to use any weapon that will check communist aggression anywhere. Even the atomic bomb. A few bombs on Moscow will shake the communist world. As America's allies try to persuade Washington not to escalate the war to a global conflagration, the world stands on the brink. January 1951, with an atomic war in Korea looming, the military situation for UNC forces on the ground suddenly eases as the advance of northern and Chinese forces is held. The threat of the deployment of atomic weapons recedes for the time being. Wonju, 100 kilometers southeast of Seoul, 23rd of February, 1951. The advance of the North is halted at the cost of 17,000 UNC casualties. They are even greater on the Communist side. A North Korean officer's report. Our men are exhausted. Most of our units are at half strength. We are losing too many men and the cold of winter is still gnawing at us. A swift victory will not be possible in this war. Once again, the UNC begins to move north, and by March 7th, just seven months after China entered the war, has retaken Seoul. The city changes hands once more, the fourth time since June 1950 a period of just nine months.
Spring, 1951, the Tebek Mountains, east of Seoul. Captured communist troops are under interrogation by UNC forces. General MacArthur's increasingly bellicose statements have led President Truman to relieve him of command of the UNC. General Matthew Ridgway replaces him. Despite this, MacArthur's request for atomic weapons is carried forward, and they are moved to Okinawa in Japan, in readiness. The threat to world peace is far from over, and the suffering of the men on the ground and the people of Korea will go on for more than two years. Studying elephants is difficult. Once I go into the bush, that's it. But researchers at South Africa's Addo National Park have a remarkable idea, the Ellie Cam. We've often been able to film them, but never really to see what she actually sees. And if their camera can survive baths and tree branches, they'll uncover incredible new information about elephants. Discover what they learn from the Ellie Telly. Wednesday night at 10 on WNED. He defiantly showed the world an almost godlike facade. But underneath that was this man who was desperately weak. And when Hitler seemed poised to overrun all of Europe, U.S. intelligence had a groundbreaking idea. What kind of guy is he? What are his ambitions? To create a psychological profile of the Third Reich's leader. It's like the holy grail for my field. Go inside the mind of Adolf Hitler. Thursday night at 9 on WNED. Mark Russell's comedy specials helped us see the humor in American politics. Gingrich goes to China to borrow money that Gore is returning. People would ask me, are you a Democrat, are you a Republican? My answer is yes. Jimmy Carter, give me liberty or make me an off. Teddy Kennedy defeated a man named Mitt Romney and the Mitt hit the fan in spite of the fact. It's time to celebrate Mark Russell's America. Friday night at 9 on WNED. Martin Bamford is having a very bad day. You've all slept with her. So he leaves his wife and career for a vacation in a small Cornwall village. Who is he? What's he doing here? And while the town grows on him... I want a fish. Martin, you're a doctor, not a fisherman. He has a hard time growing on them. You belong in the city, not here with us. Have you ever shot me one? No. You? Not yet. Doc Martin, the movie. Saturday night at 8 on WNED. Hello, I'm Peter Marshall. And I'm Nick Clooney with another edition of my music from the glorious Big Band era. I have a This time, we're going to focus on the great singers and remember the songs that they made famous. Night and day. Music is it's timeless. It's my music. The Big Band vocalist right here on PBS. Sunday afternoon at 5.30 on WNED. to the War of 1812, navigation between Lake Erie and the Upper Great Lakes was forced to pass through a very narrow channel on the Lower Detroit River. It was a junction where native peoples had been meeting for centuries and a strategically ideal location that could be easily defended and controlled. And so it was here in 1796 that the British built Fort Malden, also known as Fort Amherstburg and made the fort the headquarters for the British Indian Department. Earthworks, archaeological sites and barracks, along with models, maps and paintings in the museum, give an idea of what the fort looked like 
and how it's changed since the summer of 1812. There was a council house for meetings with the First Nations peoples, a commissary, and the provincial marine dockyards, where the upper Great Lake fleet was constructed. Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Oh, yay! To His Majesty's Provincial Marine, on this July the 1st, in the year of our Lord, 1,812. Note, this is a call to arms. This is where the war broke out. This is where the first American invasion took place. This is where Isaac Brock was able to solidify his defense of the provinces. When he captured Detroit, he took out the American Army of the West. It would only have been after the Americans' victory on the Niagara Peninsula that they were able to gain anything back in this area. It wasn't just British, Canadian, and the United States. There was a variety of First Nations people, and Fort Molden played a major part in the development of that relationship. It was here that General Brock first met with the great Shawnee warrior Tecumseh. Reenactment groups honor the 30 different nations who fought under the great chief and allied themselves with the British in the hope that someday they'd be given their own homeland. In May 1813, the Americans captured Fort George and the British lost the Niagara frontier. Fort Molden was isolated. The naval squadron on the American side, which was built in Erie, and it was under the command of Oliver Hazard Perry, Perry basically wanted to find a way to secure and beat the British on Lake Erie to secure that region uh, for the United States. Um, the British squadron was under the command of Admiral Barclay. Both the British and the Americans were anxious to gain control of Lake Erie. When the American squadron moved into Putin Bay in the late summer of 1813, potentially cutting off the supply routes to the forts and their native allies, the British fleet was forced to leave Amherstburg and engage in battle. They worked their way to windward all that previous night until uh, the morning when they waded uh, up to windward of the enemy and uh, the Americans came out to meet them from their uh, Putin Bay harbor and at that point the wind changed and suddenly the, the Americans had the wind advantage. The British concentrated all their fire on the American flagship and actually put it out of action. Perry, the Commodore on the American ship, left his ship, rowed over to a fresh ship and proceeded to turn the battle around and gave it back to the British who were at that point so weak and they couldn't defend themselves. So it was really a turnaround victory. The communication between Harrison and Perry was simply that Perry had wrote uh, a note to him saying that we have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, two schooners, two sloops. The jig was up for the British. They were on at the end of a long supply line and there was no way they could hold their position. Plus that the Americans followed up the victory with a very quick invasion. Uh, they put troops aboard all those ships that they had captured and uh, brought them back up to this area. The Americans could land anywhere they wanted along the north shore of Lake Erie and outflank this fort. So it was decided to destroy everything that could be of use to the Americans and began a slow retreat up the Detroit River to the Thames Valley. The British and the natives and a lot of their families and a lot of the inhabitants of Essex County, Amherstburg, Sandwich were fleeing the, the Americans. They were in small uh, naval vessels and bateaux, but they were also on foot coming along the mud path, and it was very muddy because it had been raining. Proctor, the British general, had promised Tecumseh that he would fight at the forks of the Thames in Chatham. This is the spot where Tecumseh always wanted to defend, and as you can see, it's a perfect spot. We're on higher ground, we've got the river, and we've got the creek, which is a natural barrier, so this would be a perfect spot to defend against the Americans coming up. But outnumbered and with no fortifications, they were forced to retreat further inland. Along the way, private properties were commandeered by both sides. The night before the Battle of the Thames, the British stayed at the McRae homestead. Lemuel Sherman's farmland now includes a cemetery with the remains of a burned-out barn used as a makeshift hospital by the Americans. And Tecumseh and his braves camped here at what was once Arnold's Mill. A few miles east of Thamesville, the British and Tecumseh made their stand. In cooperation with the Royal Scots Grenadiers, an annual reenactment takes place just outside of London at Fanshawe Pioneer Village. It gives a good sense of an inland battlefield and the battle that took place in October 1813. A thousand natives fought valiantly. But they and 500 British regulars were no match for 3,000 American troops. 
And when Tecumseh was killed, the native forces lost heart. It was here where uh, any chance of Tecumseh and the Indian nation forming their own nation, as they were pro promised by the British, was destroyed. Once Tecumseh was killed, that really ended uh, the Indian Confederation, and no longer was it possible, if it ever was, that the natives would have their own land. When I think of the War of 1812 and the British involvement, the British Indian Department's role, especially here in Amherstburg, is that the work that these officers of the British Indian Department and their men did to gain the respect and relationships with the various First Nations people of the West, that without that hard work, the War of 1812 would have been a much different uh, conclusion. We can always debate uh, who won the War of 1812, whether you're American, British, but if there's one thing that can't be uh, denied is who really lost the War of 1812, and that would have been the First Nations people. Hi, I'm Dr. Sherry Sanacero of Sedona Holistic Medical Center, where we treat the body, mind, and spirit. Sedona is proud to partner with WNED as the sponsor of Our Town Niagara Falls. WNED brings us the right audience we need with great information on radio and TV. Do you dare move from an ordinary to an extraordinary life? You can go way beyond just being average. There's not an average person watching this show. There's not an average person in this room tonight. All of us are extraordinary. We just have to come to believe it. Join Dr. Wayne Dyer for Wishes Fulfilled, a joyful journey to manifesting your deepest desires while living from your highest self. Tuesday night at 8 on WNED. Mark Russell's comedy specials helped us see the humor in American politics. Gingrich goes to China to borrow money that Gore is returning. People would ask me, are you a Democrat, are you a Republican? My answer is yes. Jimmy Carter, give me liberty or make me an off. Teddy Kennedy defeated a man named Mitt Romney and the Mitt hit the fan in spite of the fact. It's time to celebrate Mark Russell's America. Sunday afternoon at 3 on WNED. We're all concerned about our health, and we should be. What would you say if I told you I had a secret? A simple, easy way for you to get healthy and to release untapped internal energy. Tune in to see Brenda Watson live in the WNED studios as she takes us down the road to perfect health. Saturday at 11 on WNED. Give for me the names of your assets. You want me to use Harry's team to prove that he's a traitor? I'm here to help you. Home Secretary, I would never betray this country. You know that. The ace up our sleeve was sugar. I can't give you the names. I'll never forgive you for the damage your actions have inflicted. Thursday night at 10 on WNED. A Nova. They're more lethal than a chemical weapon. One sting from this and you will be dead. More toxic than cyanide. That's enough material to kill three or four individuals. 